know that Washington is really um, the epitome of many trends in city these, day, these days, which is incredible growth, yes. incredible gentrification, uh, economic growth, uh, millennials moving everywhere, farm to table restaurants on every corner, you know. Um, not every corner. <laughs> not That's every corner. That's what we're working on. But so there's this, this blossoming of gentrification in our cities, in particular in Washington. But I want to ask you about the other side to that story, which is that that is not everyone, and that can create uh, and accentuate a sense of haves and have nots. Would you agree? Well, this is what I know about our city. I had the privilege of being born and raised here at a time uh, where you wouldn't be able to mention too many accolades about our city. Uh, we weren't first in uh, the things that you wanted to be first in. And we have experienced a, a real renaissance in Washington where people are moving here, businesses are moving here, our schools are improving, we're safer. Uh, and so we want that type of prosperity. And what I frequently say as mayor, and I did as a, as a council member, uh, and I tell all of our communities, is nothing stays the same. It's going to get better or it's not. Um, and so what we want to do as, as leaders in the city is always make sure that we are investing in prosperity and trying to bring more people along. Um, and that's why I, I ran for mayor. Our commitment has been to closing gaps in schools, in jobs, job training, and economic development. And we have started our first nine months in office doing exactly that. And what are some of the ways that you've done that? You, I know you created a new budget which went into effect October 1st. Um, what are some of the changes you put in place? Well, one of the big commitments, Lee, that I made was $100 million uh, in affordable housing. Um, one of the biggest pressure points uh, when you have thousands, like a thousand people moving in a town each and every month is the pressure on housing prices. It goes through the roof. So people with regular jobs, middle income families uh, will soon, if we don't get in the breach, will find Washington unaffordable. Uh, so each and every year, the government will be involved in making sure that we're building affordable housing. That's important. We're investing in ending homelessness, especially for families and veterans and chronic homelessness in our city, which is going to be huge. But but at the same time, while we're doing those things and making human services investments, we also have to feed the economic engine um, that moves our city. So I'm attracting businesses. I'm investing in our, our sports capital, because we are a sports capital too, uh, and making sure that businesses find Washington a great place to work and do business. One of the things you maybe did not plan for that happened shortly after you came into office was there was a rise in crime. And this summer in particular, crime uh, homicides were up 43% over last year. Uh, what do you think is causing that? Well, I was with um, our new attorney uh, general and big city mayors from all over our country. And what we see is for many, a myriad of reasons, not just one, cities all around our country are experiencing a spike in violence. Um, and we have dealt with spikes. Uh, we have a great woman who runs our police department with an outstanding force of police. We have community members who want to lock arms with police. Um, and we're also investing in our youth and human services and jobs for, for youth um, to work on that. Uh, and one thing, we think our city is going to be in the forefront of the community policing issue in the months to come. I made an investment in this budget uh, that all of our patrol officers would be equipped with body cameras. Um, so we're attracting, uh, attacking, I should say, and making sure uh, that we're making our neighborhoods safer and stronger with a, a real comprehensive approach. When you announced some of these changes, there, was, there were some protesters at this press conference, and things got tense and they got rowdy, and you sort of put your foot down and you said, I will not stand down or be scared away. Right. Uh, what, what came of that, or what was that moment like for you? Uh, well, it's, it's difficult. Uh, first of all, we had a very difficult situation. We were in a community that had experienced a 90% increase um, in violent crime. And uh, we presented, and we were there to open up a new recreation center in that community. Um, and the people who were being most affected by the violence were having their moment to talk about the issues um, overshadowed by people who didn't want to be constructive. What it taught me, uh, and I've learned in, in years of politics, is uh, when you know what your center is and what is right and you've made a decision, uh, you go out there and you tell people what you know is right. And that's, that's what people expect um, from their chief executive, and that's uh, what, what will make them get behind you. 
some of the protests were linked to the nationwide movement that was prompted by events in Ferguson and Baltimore, uh, Baltimore so close to us here. Yeah. But you have not had an issue like that. Do you think or fear that that could happen at some point? Well, we think um, over the years, now we haven't always had great police and community relations. When I was growing up in Washington, it was a very different experience with the police and communities, but I think a lot of people have worked long and hard to build, uh, to build trust. Um, but what I know is that it's, it's fragile. And you always have to uh, make sure you're investing in training of officers and that officers are in communities when uh, in good times, um, and that uh, officers and police get, uh, officers in our community members get to know each other. Uh, so we are, uh, we're grateful uh, that we have a, a force that respects the community, but we know we have to always be mindful of it. Another topic uh, that's been kind of in the news with cities lately is the uh, regulation over the sharing economy, um, Uber, Airbnb. Um, mm -hmm. Have you changed your regulations at all? I know you made some changes with the taxi commission here in D.C. Talk about how you've approached that. Well, D.C. has really embraced the, the sharing economy. And I'll, I'll tell you, even I've been in elective office uh, about 10 years now, including my time as an advisory neighborhood commissioner. And uh, the sharing economy has so quickly transformed the way people uh, do business um, in the city. And it really started, it didn't, a lot of people think it started with Uber, but it started in DC with food trucks. Uh, and how uh, people's demand for where they buy food and how they buy food got ahead of regulations. And so always governments want to make sure people are safe and that we're regulating public space and uh, that we're doing all those things. So there's a space for regulation. Um, but you cannot ignore uh, when people demand change. And you can, always, you can see it with food trucks because they're lines. Uh, and so now we, have to, we had to get in the space to regulate um, them fairly but allow consumer choice. And that's the same thing uh, we had with uh, the ride sharing services. And you had some uh, meetings with, uh, with Travis Kalanick, the CEO of Uber. You've met Travis. What were those yes. like? They were, they were fun. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, you, you know that uh, he, he is, he's passionate about uh, providing options and this technological solution for people. And quite frankly, it has improved not only uh, the availability of uh, ride-sharing services like Uber, but also it has forced our taxi cab industri industry uh, to innovate. And so I think that we have many, many more options for DC residents, especially, uh, and I don't know if this is the, the experience in all cities, uh, but I was always interested in uh, innovating in that space because there were too many places in our city where people could not get a taxi cab. Um, and so that competition in the marketplace, I think, is going to and has uh, already improved options for D.C. residents all over the city. You are a sixth-generation Washingtonian? Well, fifth, yes. Fifth? Okay. A long time. <laughs> uh, Talk to us about your father, who played a big role in your life and, and maybe seeded, planted the seed for you to get involved in politics. He was a, a, a city activist, a neighborhood commissioner. Tell, tell me about him. Well, in D.C., uh, we have a position called advisory neighborhood commissioner. And so for those of you not really familiar with how our government is laid out, we are a city, a county, and a state all at once. Um, and that has some, some privilege in that the mayor of Washington in a lot of ways functions as a governor. We have a lot of control over the way we do things. It has a very significant disadvantage, however, in that we, the 600,000 people of Washington, D.C., do not have a vote in Congress. Our delegate cannot vote, and we do not have two senators. Um, but one part of our, our, our limited home rule charter says that we will have this neighborhood commission um, and they uh, provide advice uh, to the government on regulations and all of that. And so I grew up that way. My dad was in the first class of ANC commissioners um, that was, were laid out in our home rule charter from 1976. So I grew up passing out flyers, going to ANC meetings, and really with the ex expectation from both of my parents that uh, everybody who could uh, help our city should help our city. And now you live, D.C. is also unique in that there is no uh, mayor's residence, no official mayor's residence. So you live in a row house in Riggs Park, which is a working class neighborhood. You live next to a family of uh, Colombian refugees. Uh, what is it like to have really, I mean, to be living among the people like that? 
Um, well, I've lived there 15 years, mm -hmm. so it's really no difference so for me. So nothing's changed for me. Nothing you. has changed for me. Uh, well, some things have changed. You've got a, uh, now you've got I a have security a house yes, outside. I have a security uh, booth outside. And uh, Briggs Park is a neighborhood that's been exceedingly good to me. Um, I love uh, my neighbors. I love where I live. And, you know, at some point, maybe I'll need more space, but people have embraced uh, me and, um, and and what I've been able to do. They elected me now. How many? Two times, twice as ANC commissioner, three times as council member, and now once as mayor. Um, so they've been good to me, and it also puts me uh, close to my folks. Uh, I, I live now five minutes where from where I grew up, uh, and even with all the things that I have to do uh, as mayor, there's still uh, I, I like being able to support my 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 parents who need a little bit more help. And you go grocery shopping by yourself, well, with, with your security. People are surprised to see you do that. Well, it's interesting, because you mentioned the, the point about the house. I think people are, are surprised in some cases that there is no kind of place where the mayor, official place where the mayor lives. But people will frequently stop me in the grocery and say, what are you doing here? Uh, to which I say, what are you doing here? <laughs> uh, and uh, the mayor has to eat. Uh, so the mayor goes, goes grocery shopping. And uh, we have, and it's very, it's a, still a, a hometown place. I tease people, uh, I, I, I love Costco. Costco fanatic and uh, we have anyone from Costco here if, well if they are I love you and uh, but going into the Costco for me is like having a community meeting because people are there they get to, a chance to talk to you and um, I love it and that, that's that's why I do what I do the mayor next door who has a question for mayor Bowser anyone in the audience Hi, I'm Maxine Clark from St. Louis, Hi, founder, founder of Build-A-Bear Workshop. Uh, you've, uh, the mayors preceding you have all had a major role in education since Mayor Fente. How are you engaging in education? And I know that this is a city where both public and charter schools work closely together. I'm a friend of, um, of Hi uh, uh, Henderson, Ms. Henderson, and I think that she's done a great job. How are you managing all of that and improving education as we go. Well, it's fantastic um, what's happened in Washington. Um, since I've been on the council since 2007, is when we really embraced school reform in a big way. Michelle Ree was then um, our chancellor, and we have increasingly improved. One thing that people envy about Washington is that we've had sustained leadership for almost that whole period of time. We now see our graduation rates going up, people coming back to the public schools. Now our focus on is, uh, how we change gaps. So our big issue right now is leveraging public school dollars, making sure the traditional schools and our, our very robust public charter school sector are helping us improve together um, the, the education of our public school students. So we're really focused on more cooperation between the two sectors. We're out of time, but I would like to just end by making one final point, which is that Washington, D.C. is the only city where, uh, with a woman mayor, a woman head of the police department, yes. and a woman schools chancellor. So um, anyway, thank you for thank being you. with us. It's my pleasure. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well done.